Thank you. So I'm, I'm willing to bet you didn't come for a biology lesson tonight, and that, that, that you would hope to learn all there is about mitochondria. But I'm actually hoping you do learn your biology lesson tonight and how mitochondria function. Because, so basically, we are going to talk a little bit about the function of the mitochondria and how they work. So then we can then talk about the therapies and how you apply those therapies to help heal and recover your mitochondria. Um, but one thing I want to start with before I get into the mitochondria is um, a little bit about you. So I, I often, when patients come to my office, whether they're children or adults, and they have mitochondrial issues, they fall into one of three categories. And the first one is GI. It's all these gut issues. My gut is killing me. I don't digest well. I have a sore stomach. How many of you kind of have those GI issues? Okay, not everybody. And then the middle group is fatigue. They're just so fatigued, they have no energy, they don't have any stamina, they just wear out, the brain, the brain fog is really intense. How many would you describe that? Now you're gonna overlap, so some of are all three categories. Third category is more of the autoimmune, the rashes, more of the asthma, joint pain is tremendous, a lot of joint pain. How many of you have more of the joint issues? Yeah, so those, are different categories. Some people fall in all three. Some people are stronger in one than the other. But beneath all of those categories is poor mitochondrial function. So if you understand why your mitochondria are failing you, then you can learn how you can fix that. It's a lot like trying to take care of your car. I mean, if you don't know how to maintain your car and you let things go, you don't, you know, there is, your car will break down. So it's about learning about the maintenance of the mitochondria. So we're gonna start with some biology to understand the mitochondria, and I'm hoping I can make this fun, but at, at the end of the day, I really want you to come away understanding how your mitochondria, what they need to work, what causes them to fail. All right, so here's, the mitochondria is in the cell. Every cell in the body has mitochondria in it, sometimes multiple mitochondria. And it's the function of that mitochondria to make ATP. ATP is ultimately the fuel that every cell in the body needs to make energy or to do its job. It's like the, it's like the dollar bill. ATP is the currency that you buy everything with and that, you, that works in the body to help everything work. And what's probably gonna be surprising to you is that little tiny mitochondria in the cell can make your body's weight in ATP every day. They recycle it, recreate it, but it's going all the time to make that ATP so we have the energy we need to make our brain work and to make our heart work and make our muscles work and make our gut work. So ATP is really important, but mitochondria has to be working 24 seven to make an, enough ATP to fuel the body. The majority of the oxygen that we breathe is used by the mitochondria to make ATP. So mitochondria is pretty important, right? Um, the other thing about the ATP is that ATP is used both for our energy to make our body work, it's used for detoxification to get rid of those toxins in our body. So ATP is really critical, that currency. And finally, mitochondria, they're really strong, hard little workers, but they're very vulnerable to toxins, oxidative stress. You know, by, by making energy in your body, you give off sparks and like a flames essentially, that, that energy creates that heat, that oxidative stress, and that has to be put out like by antioxidants, such as those things that come from fruits and vegetables. So if you have a lot of oxidative stress, not enough antioxidants, that oxidative stress is creating damage to tissues around it. So mitochondria are really vulnerable to that oxidative stress. And then if you don't feed them, they don't get enough vitamins and the minerals that they need. They become, you know, they're not able to do their work. And if they don't get enough oxygen, um, they're really vulnerable to low oxygen states. And that would generally come with not good heart function. So your heart can't pump, it can't get the blood and oxygen out to areas where it's needed. Then your mitochondria in those areas in that tissue, like your feet, your hands, it, your brain, it can't work as well without the oxygen. So it's, it's more of a heart issue there. Um, I just talked about that. Actually, the only other thing I wanna say is 
we eat to give fuel to our mitochondria. So all the carbohydrates, the fats, the proteins that we take into our body go through different metabolic pathways. Some of you may remember this from biology, you know, beta oxidation, glycolysis, but they each go through a different path pathway so they're broken down and they travel then to the mitochondria to help make energy, ATP. So we eat to make fuel. Um, we're gonna get into this whole mitochondria Krebs cycle in just a minute. Um, but on, on the slide, you can see that the fats are coming in, the carbohydrates are coming in, the proteins are coming in. They're all bring, being broken down and they go so, through something called the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. How many of you remember the Krebs cycle? I've heard of it. How many of you have heard of it? The old Krebs cycle from biology was in, is in the mitochondria. And it's that Krebs cycle that goes in round and round and helps to make that ATP, that energy. Um, there, there are a cute few, couple of key things. And I, I'm bringing these things up because you'll hear us talk about supplements, like carnitine's a supplement some of you have probably heard of. Ketones are ketone diets that you hear thrown around. I want you to understand that when you leave, why people talk about that. So carnitine is something that the fats need in order to get into the mitochondria. So that's the ship that kind of shuttles those fats into the mitochondria, so it's pretty critical in getting fats into the cell. So if you're deficient in carnitine, you can't really mobilize your fats, which are very important in making energy. Um, you know, it's insulin that takes the carbohydrates in. And then ketones can go in directly. They don't need to be shuttled in. So for people that have poor function, sometimes the ketones from a ketogenic diet can float in and don't need to be transported in. And people do better on a ketogenic diet because they have so, such low energy, they can't get the, the carbohydrates and the protein into their cells, but the ketones just float right in. So there, there is strategy to a ketogenic diet sometimes. The other thing is there are vitamins and minerals that are absolutely critical for the Krebs cycle to run normally and that whole mitochondria. And I put a list of those here. So you guys all probably hear about magnesium. How many of you take magnesium? Almost everybody, you probably all should. Magnesium is critical for all those um, enzymes in our body. Niacin, niacin is a vitamin B3. We're gonna, before, everyone will probably go home tonight and buy some niacin and some riboflavin. And I'll explain why when we talk about the Krebs cycle. Niacin's really critical in that Krebs cycle. And riboflavin is another, it's a B vitamin. It's really critical in that Krebs cycle. And there, niacin is the NAD plus. And that plus is a hook. It's gonna be hanging on to hydrogen ions. We're gonna talk about that in more detail. Riboflavin, think of the F as the flavin. That's got a hook on it too. So it can transport something to the hydrogen ion. We've got the CoQ10. Anybody taking CoQ10? Yeah, a lot of you are. As we get older, we all probably should. CoQ10 now works in the electron transport chain as a shuttle. It's carrying some of those hydrogen ions along the shuttle. Um, so it's really critical in making energy. If you're low in CoQ10, for a variety of reasons, one could be you're taking cholesterol medication. If you take cholesterol medication, some of those really lower your CoQ10, then you don't have your shuttle to help make the ATP, then your muscle, that's where you get the muscle soreness and the aches and pains. If you're on cholesterol medication, it's because your CoQ10 is low and you can't make energy. So you take your CoQ10 to fix that get back in shape. We talked about the carnitine. Carnitine is there to take the fats in, you know, the shuttle, it's a ship. Ribose is another thing you may not have heard of. It was studied at the University of Minnesota for heart muscle energy. Um, ribose is like a glucose gets turned into ribose and the ribose then can help make ATP. So ribose is a very quick way to kind of recover ATP if you're deficient. Like if you're running out, if for some reason you can't metabolize your glucose, you're so weak, ribose can actually go in and then immediately make some ATP. So it, it's used by athletes for muscle, continued muscle energy. It's used by, um, in some heart medications to help with heart muscle, because you don't have to metabolize a lot of food to make that ATP. So ribose is another really important thing to help quickly make fuel when you're running out of energy. Let me see if I could get this to work. Okay, 
there's a take home lesson here. There's, I, I found this online. This is the Krebs cycle and it shows how it works. Very complicated, all these carbon oxygen molecules. It's going round and round. But really the important take home message for the Krebs cycle, food comes in, it feeds that Krebs cycle, it goes round and round. But notice the niacin NAD with the hook and the riboflavin FAD with the hook. They're hooking hydrogen ions, also known as electrons or protons. They're the carriers of hydrogen ions. So this cycle goes round and round to create these hydrogen ions that can hook onto your niacin and your riboflavin that can then be carried up into the electron transport chain and dumped in there to make the wheels of the electron transport chain go round and round and then make ATP. So the really critical thing about the Krebs cycle is that you give it the right nutrients so that it can go round and round, but the output of that are hydrogen ions carried by niacin and riboflavin. So this is a, a biology um, teacher, a high school biology teacher who actually put a little video together. I'm hoping this will work. But I want you to pay attention to the output of the Krebs cycle, the NAD and the FAD and the hydrogen ions. of the mitochondria of all our cells is the cycle of reactions that will hands Krebs the Nobel Prize. The cycle takes the energy and food and makes it into other forms your cells can use. Krebs cycle makes electron carrier NADH, which later brings electrons to the electron transport chain. And Krebs makes FADH do its function is the same. Krebs also makes some ATP, another claim to fame with talking Krebs. It's a citric acid cycle, Krebs. Tricarboxylic acid cycle Krebs each cycle makes one ATP, 3 NADH1, FADH2. Right before the cycle's a transitional part, links Krebs to glycolysis so Krebs can start. Enzymes rake a CO2 off a pyruvate, yields an NADH and acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA carries carbons too, with all the energy that derives from food. It's a highly reduced molecule with energized electrons that fuels up the Krebs cycle as it cycles on. Now at the start of Krebs, this acetyl-CoA has the two carbons it carries in with the way. Enzymes put these on oxaloacetate with carbons for, makes six carbon citric acid, who could ask for more? Notice three carboxyl groups on the citric acid, that's why the cycle's also named for tricarboxylic acid or TCA cycle if it's acronyms that you prefer. Krebs in honor of its discoverer. Krebs, it's a citric acid cycle, Krebs. Tricarboxylic acid cycle, Krebs. Each cycle makes one ATP, 3-NADH1, FADH2. Enzymes work on citric So, a lot of carbons and oxygen in there. That all gets fueled by vitamins and minerals, needs that. It's going round and round. But did you see what it does? It's basically the NAD plus grabs onto a hydrogen ion or electron, and it's going to carry it. So that's the really important thing about the Krebs cycle. And um, I think it, that's, you know, we, um, uh, we learned a lot about the Krebs cycle for um, autism in particular because it's not working very well. Well, it's not working very well for Lyme disease either. You know, and there are a lot of reasons why. There are toxins can cause that Krebs cycle not to go round and round. So if it's not going round and round, you've got mercury, lead, aluminum that don't let it go round and round. You're not creating those hydrogen ions and they cannot be carried up to the electron transport chain. If you aren't feeding it the right niacin riboflavin, you're low in your B vitamins, there's nothing to carry the hydrogen ions. So the Krebs cycle is really important in, within that mitochondria. Um, so if we review, this is just a slightly different picture of the Krebs cycle. So you, you can see the NAD plus going to NADH. It's got a hydrogen ion right there. There's a lot of energy in those hydrogen ions. Think of them as quarters. And they're going to take all those quarters up to the electron transport chain, dump them in, they go round and round, they'll spit out a dollar bill. You know, they create that currency so that can be used by the body. So it basically we're creating a lot of hydrogen ions going up into the electron transport chain, and that will create ATP. What do you need that's really critical? Niacin, riboflavin, both are B vitamins. You gotta have CoQ10 in the electron transport chain. You need some good CoQ10 up there, that's not gonna work. And sometimes 
people are that are really low energy need ribose to help them just keep that whole electron transport chain moving. So the question is, well, why don't they work? Why is it that you get brain fog? Why do you get muscles that are weak? Why do you get the fatigue in the gut that's not working with? A lot of that is poor mitochondrial function. And you know, the Lyme disease is kicking up that inflammation, but it's your mitochondria that is trying to keep up with it and probably not, doing a, not able to do its job. So there are a number of reasons why that mitochondria might not be working. So just to blame all of your symptoms on Lyme disease isn't gonna help you get well unless you understand what is going, what's going wrong with your body. And so mitochondrial dysfunction can be deficiencies. Niacin, riboflavin, we've talked about that. If you don't have enough of those hydrogen ion carriers, your, your uh, Krebs cycle, can't get the hydrogen ions up into the electron transport chain. So those are two really critical B vitamins that you should be taking on a regular, everybody should be, you know, have adequate doses of niacin and riboflavin. We just don't do it with the modern diet that we have. We don't get enough of those things, I think, in our diet in general. You might be deficient in CoQ10. Um, a number of people are. So CoQ10 is another thing that you saw as the little carrier going to carry those hydrogen ions in the electron transport chain. So you need adequate CoQ10. You need magnesium. You need tons of magnesium. Magnesium works everywhere in the body. So getting a lot of magnesium is a good thing too. I could talk a little bit about a, a strategy I use to get adequate magnesium into your body. Carnitine. If you really think you're you're sluggish and you're not making progress, some people, we put them on carnitine to see if that helps as well. And then lots and lots of antioxidants to put out the flames that you're creating from all of that oxidative stress. So your antioxidants are things like vitamin C, vitamin E, and, and things like polyphenols and things from fruits and vegetables, and vegetables in particular. It's easier to get your fruits in, but I think the vegetables contain a lot of potent antioxidants. The other thing that can harm mitochondria, and I think this is a big one that we totally underestimate, is all of the toxins in our environment. And those include heavy metals. Aluminum is, is everywhere now. Um, we've got a lot of aluminum. We've got mercury. We've got um, uh, arsenic, um, cadmium. We've got those heavy metals everywhere in the environment. We have a significant number of pesti pesticides and in, in industrial chemicals and they're everywhere around us, we don't see them. So you can't really use that, you know, you can't, you don't have gauges on your body that say I'm this full of pesticides or this full of heavy metals, you know, but they're everywhere in our environment now. There are some 80,000 um, chemicals in the environment that, that are ending up in our body. And some people are better at detoxifying those things and getting them out of their body than others. Some people are really poor detoxifiers. So you really accumulate those toxins what do those toxins do? They don't let, they interfere with mitochondrial function. They slow down mitochondrial function. So now you're getting low, you're like low on low power, low battery. Um, the other thing that can happen is with all of this inflammation you get, you get a lot of cell waste. You get like garbage cans full of cell waste in the cell and around the cell. You've got to get rid of that waste or that interferes with mitochondrial function too if you can't get the garbage out. And then the last thing is you've got to have adequate oxygen and perfusion to all of those organs in your brain in order to, as they said, you know, get the, the electron transport chain to run. It doesn't run without oxygen. So um, if you look at this Krebs cycle in the middle, so here's our Krebs cycle going round and round and then dumping our hydrogen ions up into the, the um, blue complexes, right? Here's something that you probably don't know about um, the Krebs cycle is that dysbiosis, abnormal, unhealthy gut bacteria, can actually slow down your Krebs cycle. This was discovered um, for children with autism. It was like a, it's a recent, probably within the last five years, they've figured this out. So in children with autism, they tend to have an overgrowth of yeast in the gut and clostridium bacteria. And what they found was this overgrowth of Clostridium bacteria was producing something called propionic acid. And that propionic acid was then going up into the Krebs cycle and jumping the line. And instead of going all the way around, like the blue was, all the way around, it shortened the cycle and would just go halfway. 
So you get a cycle that's like on 50% power now because of that propionic acid dumping in there. So it was cre creating like less energy, less hydrogen ions, right? You have uh, about half the number of hydrogen ions now that can go up and make ATP. So you are dramatically reducing the amount of ATP you can produce. So what they were finding is that overgrowth of that gut bacteria was causing that plume. It wasn't really a toxin, it's a natural byproduct of that bacteria. It was just too much of it, and that was causing the mitochondrial to slow down and function. So in a lot of you with dysbiosis, if you have your bacteria checked and you find that you don't have good bacteria, but you have this clostridium and yeast overgrowth, it's probably slowing down your mitochondria. And so you gotta work to then clean up your gut and to get rid of that imbalance, to help it rebalance. So that's another reason the gut can affect the whole body if you have an abnormal bacteria in the gut, like this clostridium. I can tell you one more thing we're finding about some of the overgrowth of the yeast and the bacteria is that glyphosate, which is found in Roundup, which is used extensively in our crops now, the glyphosate that's in Roundup, actually, um, when it gets into our bodies, it doesn't kill us, it doesn't harm our cells. But our gut bacteria are more like um, the bacteria in nature. So it kills our good bacteria. So the glyphosate, the Roundup, is killing off all your good bacteria. But guess what it doesn't kill? The propionic acid producing clostridium bacteria. So, and probably yeast. So you know, we're seeing a lot of this in children with autism and there are some new theories that maybe the glyphosate, the huge increase in Roundup in our crops, could be affecting gut bacteria in children, could be contributing to poor mitochondrial function and leading to autism, autism features. But you've got to wonder if it isn't part of Lyme disease too. Because, you know, you have such poor function. Where's that coming from? Is it all Lyme disease or is it other things? So I, th I think these are things... We don't really know the answer to all of these things yet, but I think it's, I throw it out there because we're still learning, we all have to learn together. The other thing that can damage and interfere with mitochondrial function is inflammation. And people with Lyme disease tend to have a lot of inflammation. Inflammation is like the forest fires and the hurricanes. It just creates all of this debris in the body. That has to be managed. The mitochondria have to create enough energy for it to be pushed out of the body, which takes away energy from your brain and your muscles and your gut, you know, to clean up your body. It's a lot of work to get rid of all that garbage, right? So inflammation is creating a ton of work for your body and robbing your body of the ATP you need to get your brain to work. So some of your brain fog might be that it, you're, you have to, your brain's less important than getting rid of all of that inflammation and all the garbage, because if you don't get rid of that, you don't make ATP. So you're robbing your brain and other muscles and things of ATP to clean up the garbage. Does that make sense? You know, you've only got so much cash, you know. It's hard to make enough to keep up with all of this. So inflammation is very toxic to the mitochondria. Um, just to, you know, again, looking at the cell, looking at the mitochondria within the cell, the main source of energy is that eight hydrogen ion gets turned into ATP. In summary, what, why doesn't my mitochondria work? Well, either I'm not, and I'm not getting my nutrients in, or I've got too much toxin, environmental toxin accumulation, or I'm low in oxygen, or I've got too much inflammation. You know, so those are the things to think about when you're really trying to recover your body. It's, it's either one or all, and or all of those. So how are we gonna support the mitochondria? Well, we're gonna make sure you get the right nutrients, right? And we may need to bypass the poorly functioning Krebs cycle with things like ribose or hydrogen ions if, until we can recover the rest of the body. You may need to do things like that. You might need extra oxygen, which is one of the reasons hyperbaric seems to be beneficial for people with a lot of inflammation. We do our best to reduce inflammation, and that could be improve your diet. Make you know why do I have people go on an organic diet? It's full of toxins and pesticides and non-foods that your body still has to metabolize that create a lot of inflammation too. So getting on a healthier, cleaner diet reduces the burden of the junk 
coming in if you're really f full already. <laughs> if you need to take the garbage out, you don't have room for more garbage. So we want to try and reduce that inflammation. A healthy diet can help that. Reduce oxidative stress. R try very hard to get enough of those fruits and vegetables, vegetables and antioxidants into your body to put the flame out to keep it from damaging other things. And then do things to improve detoxification. There are a number of things that can help with that. Um, so I start with food. We start with the basics. Make sure you do as much of an organic whole food diet as you can. There are some people um, that benefit from a ketogenic diet, but I strongly, strongly recommend you work with a good qualified dietitian if you're going to do a ketogenic diet. Because there are some people that are already very high in ammonia for a variety of reasons and their gut's not working well. And they do that ketogenic diet and they're going to create more ammonia and they're just going to crash. So you got to do it, I think, with, some, with somebody that's qualified. And then again, mitochondrial nutrient support. We need some niacin, riboflavin, ribose, CoQ10, magnesium. Do you feel like you're familiar with those last five things now that I've repeated them a few times? These are some of my favorite nutrients. But there are other therapies, like Gail talked about hyperbaric. There are other therapies that can help the mitochondria. And one is something called ultra-low microcurrent. And this type of microcurrent is, it's like an electrical stimulation. It's a machine, I'll show you in a minute, um, that's FDA approved device to, you, to administer a very low current to the tissue. It could be over the liver, over the gut, in the brain. And that microcurrent has been found to imp increase ATP production by 500%. It's pretty significant. So, it isn't just that you treat your brain with that. You can treat a gut that's not functioning well with microcurrent to put some energy in there to help soothe and heal a gut. I've used it a lot for um, like athletes, high school athletes when my boys were playing football. It's amazing like for high ankle sprain where you get all this inflammation and you get poor circulation. You can see right away when you do microcurrent on that tissue, you get a reduction in the swelling, you get improved perfusion, you get reduction in pain. You know, you have those athletes back out on the field in, in half the time. They heal so much faster when you can add microcurrent to that. So microcurrent's another awesome technology um, for healing. Result, reduce inflammation, improve mitochondrial energy, circulation, you get rap, more rapid tissue healing and repair. And it, this, the machine that I use has, um, you can do brain waves on it. So a lot of times people, when they're stressed, are stuck in that sympathetic mode, like the deer in the headlights, your, your adrenaline's always up, you're just stuck in that high anxiety mode. And when you're in high anxiety, you don't clean your house. You don't detoxify, you don't get rid of the garbage. You don't, you're not able to clean out your body. So you really need to turn that off and get into that parasympathetic mode so now you can start to take out the garbage and clean the house. Um, so the microcurrent machine has a headband uh, uh, mode on that. And there are other, Gail actually has a device too. There are other alpha stim or stimulation devices that can help people get into that calm parasympathetic mode. So if you're somebody who's always stuck in that high anxiety mode, you might want to try a device that turns that off and brings the body down so that you can, you can clean house, basically. It's really important. You can't get rid of garbage if you're always going out to war and going to fight a war. Uh, let me see here. Uh, these are some of the common things we use the microcurrent for. I'm just going to show you the device, though. So this is how the device, one is, uh, these are both their instruments that we use in the, in the clinic. One is more for muscles, bone, and the other is more of a, a general, um, electrical stem. Here's just an example of a couple people. Here's a little boy using the headbands in the clinic. Um, and both these people with very high anxiety. It is amazing that after about five minutes, you just start to see it kind of melt away. Most people, we can get them into a much more relaxed mode. It's pretty amazing for them too. Um, here's another one where we're actually using probes on the Abdomen, when there's inflammation in the abdomen. I have a probe that you can use in the mouth that gets closer to the brain. Um, when I want to treat areas of the brain, it's a pretty fantastic um, tool. So those are the microcurrent. So with microcurrent, we increase ATP, we reduce inflammation, 
hopefully with that microcurrent are improving circulation. So it's another helpful tool, I think, another tool in the toolkit. Another one, you, I think I didn't put a hyperbaric on here, but do most of you know about hyperbaric oxygen, where you go into a tank and you um, go into a deep dive, they put you under pressure, that forces the oxygen to dissolve in the plasma. It forces it to get out in deep into those tissues there where you don't have good circulation. Oxygen can go out places where Lyme um, bugs hide too, and Lyme does not. It likes to hide away from oxygen. So you can force that oxygen out into tissues. So it's thought to be both a mechanism whereby you can kill with the oxygen, because it doesn't, the Lyme organisms don't like oxygen, but it also improves tissue healing. So remember, you get the oxygen out there. Now the mitochondria can make ATP, so you can improve the circulation in that tissue too and get even white cells to where they need to be. So you're both improving perfusion and you're using that concentrated oxygen, almost like an antibiotic um, for Lyme disease. But you do that in a tank under pressure. In the next slide, you'll see in the background, that's an example of the hyperbaric chamber. It's really tough for people that are claustrophobic you know, I know. So maybe what we, well, sometimes what we do, if you really can't get into that chamber, there are home chambers that you can do where you don't have to put the hood on and you don't feel so isolated. So that's a little easier for many people. But there is another therapy we're using too that's called exercise with oxygen therapy. And that's this bike. See um, the bladder, see the big white bag behind him? That's full of oxygen, 100% oxygen. And what this, this athlete is doing is he's biking while he's breathing in that oxygen. And what we, we do is we'll go on the bike breathing in the oxygen. Now, if you're somebody that doesn't have good mitochondrial function, you can't make a lot of ATP, I don't really wanna force you to go very fast on a bike. We take it low and slow, get the oxygen in, dilate up those blood vessels, just kind of help you get oxygen deeper into tissue. But once you get a little healthier, we'll do what's called high intensity intervals, where you're, we'll get you to speed up for a minute on the high oxygen and then cool down. And then speed goes fast again, but on low concentrations of oxygen. So if we turn the oxygen down low, your blood vessels, everything's gonna dilate and say, I need some oxygen. So everything's dilating up now. Give me some oxygen, right? So for a minute, we make you cycle really fast and then you cool down and then we get blast back in the oxygen. So now everything's opened up, poosh, in goes all that oxygen out to tissue. So this exercise with oxygen is proving to be a nice handy tool for people that either can't get into the chamber, wanna do a much shorter treatment, um, can still do some healing with oxygen. And then what I like to do is, and it'll help what that kind of exercise does is it increases the number of mitochondria. So you have more mitochondria that can make more energy. So it's improving mitochondrial function by improving the number, creating more mitochondria. Um, one of the things I like to do, we're doing now in our clinic is we're having people do that bike and get really revved up, kind of flushed. They often are sweating. And then we'll put them into an ionic foot bath, which is for detoxification. So it's like you've revved everything up, you're cleaning everything out, dumped everything into the lymphatics. Now you want it to get out of the body. So a nice ionic foot bath, I think, is a way to kind of pull some of those toxins out of the body. One thing that we've, um, research is sh showing currently is this ionic foot bath can pull glyphosate out of the body into the bath water, and, you know, which is that, again, the pesticide, which is causing to the bacteria to die off in our gut. So I think if it's bringing glyphosate out, we don't know for sure, but we're hoping that it's bringing other toxins out too. But a lot of people really are finding benefit from that combination of the bike and the foot bath. The foot bath is something you can do at home. Some people can, I think it's, it's not cheap to buy the EWAT units, they're probably around $4,000. $4, but, you know, it's another thing I throw out there that, um, you know, you, you gotta have tools in the toolbox when you're dealing with, the, with chronic illnesses like Lyme. Oxygen therapy. Um, here's another one of my inexpensive favorites. So we want a lot of antioxidants, right? You're gonna get that from food if you can. I like to use fruit and vegetable powders you can, buy, you can buy them at Whole Foods. 
um, when they're, they're freeze dried, so they maintain all of their antioxidants and their, the majority of their minerals and their vitamins. So these freeze dried fruit and vegetable powders, like greens, you've seen vibrant greens, or you can get them at you know, the health food stores. I do like to use those for antioxidants because it's just easy to take a scoop and throw it in water and throw it in some, here's my trick for, magne for magnesium, throw it in a Perrier, bubbly water, mineral water. Perrier is a mineral water because it has minerals. One of the minerals it has is magnesium. And it's a nice way to get magnesium into your body. It's by drinking Perrier. And I think it absorbs easily because it's kind of combined with other minerals. And it's, it's um, I find that people have leg cramps. If they drink Perrier, the leg cramps go away. I mean, I find that it really does work. It's not high dose magnesium, it's not a pill, but it seems to really work for a variety of ailments. So you take that Perrier, you take a scoop of your, let's say you get a, a the strawberry flavored fruit and vegetable powder, throw those two together. Now you've got a lot of antioxidants and magnesium, bang for the buck. So that's another thing I like to make sure you get, keep up with that inflammation. If you've got a lot of inflammation in your body, then try doing something like that to keep up with that inflammation, put that flame out. So I love to do things like that. Another one that I love is hydrogen water. This is a little device that actually, this one comes from China that we carry in our office. We had it third party tested to make sure that it actually creates the hydrogen ion that's safe. But it takes water, and you want it to be sterile water, not, you know, not from the tap. It takes water, dissociates the hydrogen from the oxygen, and creates hydrogen gas in that little carafe. It takes six minutes, now you've got hydrogen ions, and you just drink it. And the, there's lots of research on hydrogen water now that's showing that it really does work. You can absorb it and it goes and it goes where it's supposed to and it doesn't matter that you're drinking it. You don't have to inhale it. You can just drink your hydrogen water. I just saw that now Kowalski's in my neighborhood is carrying hydrogen water and it's $2.99 for this little thing like this. I don't know how much hydrogen is in there because it is a gas. So I think the carafes work really well. You make it, these are $75. You make it, you drink it, and the whole family can use it. So this is another way, I think, when your mitochondria aren't working as well as they should, maybe getting more hydrogen ions in there to help make more ATP, more energy for the body would also help. Are they called hydrogen crafts? If you go to, to if you Google hydrogen water, you'll find a variety of different devices. Um, uh, I don't know that they're called a carafe, but you'll find it if you Google it. Google it. The one thing I do um, notice, and you guys know, I know you're well aware of this, is that when you start to get that mitochondria functioning again, and you get a lot of garbage, you get sick. It's like that die-off reaction. People feel sick because they're just overloaded. You have to take all of that garbage from your mitochondria and your tissues and your brain and you dump it into your liver. And your liver has to detoxify that. And then it has to dump it in the stool and out through the gallbladder. And your liver can't always keep up if you go too fast. So if you're going really fast and you got all this garbage floating around and the liver can't handle it, it's just gonna go back in and recycle and then you just feel awful because you've got all of this, you've mobilized it from the tissue, but it's not going, it's not going out. It's kind of staying in your bloodstream and your lymphatics. So, so another thing I'll say sometimes too is be, if you find that you're starting to do these things to help improve your mitochondrial function, hyperbaric's the same way. You'll see people get really sick before they get better because they're starting. Some people have just so much stuff to mobilize that we sometimes have to slow them down, not go so fast. So they can keep up with that detoxification, right, to get that stuff out. And guess what your liver needs? It needs nutrients too. You gotta have those B vitamins, folic acid, You've got to have um, a lot of actually good amino acids from protein should be in your diet too. So you need things. Your liver's got to have nutrients too in order to get the garbage out of the body. So it might be another thing you see that sometimes you have to slow down if you're going too fast and you feel really sick. Your body is not able to handle getting rid of all of that stuff perhaps. This might be something to think about. You might have to support your liver a little bit more. Um, so. The road to recovery is complicated, I think, as 
and that's why you guys are here. Um, but hopefully it gave you some, some of the biology to understand how your body works so that it's easier to start a, ther a therapy or treatment or hydrogen water and not stop it because it didn't work. You know, it's, if you understand why you're doing things, it might be easier to put the right things together and keep going with them and stick with them so you get to that recovery faster. Okay, I'll take questions if you have questions. Sure. I do. Yeah, I do, and I love the genomics piece of it. Um, what she's talking about is we all have genes, right? They look like a ladder. On those genes are the the ladder are the SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphism. So there's a one side and the other, uh, two sides to that SNP, and those SNPs we inherit from our parents. And those SNP, the gene is responsible for a whole bunch of functions in your body. But the SNP is more of an individual function, so it might tell you how well you absorb vitamin A, how well your liver detoxifies, how well it makes glutathione, how well um, you put a methyl group on B12. So the SNPs really are very helpful, I think, in terms of customizing what supplements you should be on. Um, I think, for instance, there are people that have um, some SNPs called COMT, the COMT and the CBS mutations. And you start those people on a lot of methyl B12 or the folic acid that's methylated, and they just go nuts with anxiety because they can't handle all that methylation. They don't have the right pathway for it, so they get overwhelmed with that methylation and they just get massive anxiety. And it's, it can be hard to figure that out. But if you can see that ahead of time, you're like, oh, I don't want to put them on a lot of methylation. The flip side might be somebody that's got a lot of those methylation SNPs. Um, heart, they have heart disease in the family. People die early of strokes and heart attacks, uh, miscarriages. You see a lot of, they got a lot of those. They need a lot of methylation support. And in, by just giving them methylation and the right kind of folic acid, you can really dramatically decrease their risk of a heart attack and stroke. So it's so nice to look at these SNPs. It is helpful. It can be a little bit um, expensive to do. 23andMe has been purchased by a pharmaceutical company. So I might go with Ancestry now. And then what you need to do is you do Ancestry. It's, uh, let's say it's $99. You get that information. It tells you that you know, you're part Italian, you're part this and that. But there are raw data in there. That needs to go through an application to be interpreted. So you can sign up for something called LiveWello. I don't know if that's what you did. It's $20 on LiveWello. You might need somebody to help you with it. It's a little complicated. They'll take the raw data and they'll spit out a report for you. So now you can see, am I a COMT? Am I one of the CBS? Am I a methylation? You get that good, you get some good data. And then you need somebody probably to help you uh, kind of know what to do with it. But it's good, it's really helpful data, yeah. Yes. Has anybody put together uh, a magic pill that's combined with magnesium and niacin riboflavin and all this in a proper uh, relationship or the proper uh, amounts? Mm -hmm. You know, one little handy pill that you take in the morning? Yeah, you know, it's It's confusing. Yeah. Can I pick on somebody here that's a dietitian? <laughs> Would that be okay? <laughs> Sick, do, you, do you mind if I introduce you? Sure. Sarah was um, a, Sarah's a, diet, a registered dietitian and um, who left us to join the financial world. She's now doing. <laughs> but, um, but she and I work together in some very complicated cases. So um, I think that the biggest thing I find is, if depending on the methylation, there are some really good vitamins out there that you could all use, but if you, if you don't tolerate the methylation, you need to go with a lower methylation. So do you have anything in mind that when you think about it? In terms of brands? Yeah.
I think that's the key is you could react to your vitamins. So maybe the key is what I teach you here, what we teach you is um, how many of you have a strong family history of early heart attacks and strokes? So you're the people who probably want to make sure you've got good methylcobalamin and a methylfolinic acid in your vitamins, the methyl type. And if you take that and you don't feel any anxiety with it, you know, that's good for you. You really should do that. Um, how many of you have like this really um, high anxiety in your bipolar and anxiety in family history? Kind of, you, you might want to be careful with your methylation then. So you might take a vitamin that's got a lot of methylation in it. So try for you, I might, I think you can get this online, Pure Genomics Multivitamin is a really good quality one that I think you can get online that doesn't have that high methylation in it. I've been doing tons of supplements, and my body's already saying um, detox, like overkill. Uh, I can already just feel, and my body's telling me you're, you're doing too much. Too fast. I can't, it can't handle it. Yep, slow it, it down. It's all good stuff. Yep. It's too much. Yeah. It, yay. <laughs> That's what I want you to go away with. There are tools to say, you're going to have to manage your body and you know, try to understand and figure out what's going on and sort of, you would give up and just say, throw it all away. Instead, now you know you're just going too fast, right? You're doing the right thing, you're mobilizing, you're going too fast. I might say sauna, do more sauna if you can, because you detox through the skin. I and infrared sauna. Infrared and, day if I can. yep, well, give your, make sure you do lots of uh, mineral water to put the minerals back in and lots of electrolytes. Because if you're sauning that much, then you're depleting those too. Might be another reason. Good. Yeah. Yep. Keep up with that. Do your Perrier. I love a Perrier and <laughs> Gerl Gerl Steiner. I'm trying to ask this more as a general question. I, I do a foot uh, detox foot bath every two to four days. I've probably done 1,500 plus of them. I assume that that in general means the body's producing too much waste. Are there other therapies? If that's the case, are there therapies you can do to stop that waste from coming somewhere? It's about what, it's diet. Diet, it, and you know, it isn't just diet, because you, we breathe in glyphosate because it's in corn and it's in probably gasoline now, right? So it, it, we're breathing in all of these toxins. So I think if you're finding a lot, your, do, you, do you feel your foot bath helps? Makes you feel better? Oh, there's no question about that. Yeah, you might sauna. And, you, and just do another, complement it. Some people say do three days in a row, if you can. I think if you're able to just keep a routine up, keep doing that. But the other thing would be maybe do sauna. You're just trying to get rid of more of the toxins. You might do more things. I'm thinking uh, chlorella is another one of my favorites. Chlorella is, uh, is a, a, a green seaweed, it's a seaweed and it will hang on to heavy metals and toxins. So you take chlor the, as a capsule, a little caplet. I say do three of those twice a day. And if you tolerate them, you don't have any reaction to them. They, stay, they pretty much keep your toxins in the gut and excrete them through the gut. I first became familiar with chlorella for um, breastfeeding moms when I looked at the research, Sarah too probably, and um, we, there's data showing that it reduces you know, fat, there um, pesticides and heavy metals. Pesticides get, has, heavy metals can get stored in fat. So what do you do when you're making breast milk? You mobilize that fat to make breast milk. What comes out in your breast milk? Pesticides and heavy metals. So there is now there are studies that show that well, women who took chlorella greatly reduced the excretion of the pesticides in their breast milk. So it stayed in the stool, went out through the stool. So I, I love chlorella. I like to have. Mm -hmm. Biopure is a good brand, yeah. Yeah. More heavy metals. I think the diff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can really, I mean, it's like eating a bunch of seaweed. Yeah. yeah. So she, the brand that you mentioned is BioPure. It's online. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Just to follow up, it sounds like you're talking environmental toxins. It's not that necessarily I've got the uh, Lyme bugs producing the toxins. Correct. Okay. Correct. I won't look at it the other way. Yeah, correct. I think that the Lyme bugs, you know, not everybody that gets bitten gets chronic Lyme disease. And I think there's increasing evidence that it's those individuals that maybe have underlying genetic SNPs, you don't detoxify well, you had a lot of, you don't, de you, you don't um, detoxify stuff in the environment so it's accumulating. And then you get the inflammation that comes with Lyme disease and it just is too much to keep up with. So I suspect that's what you see is it isn't the Lyme that's producing all the havoc. So get the, you know, it is about just getting that body back in balance to try and fight, get stronger to fight that organisms. The, yeah. Um, we'll go back here. Yeah, would that EMF affect your mitochondria? Oh, of course. <laughs> yes, the EMF in it, um, your cells can't signal. So your best bet is to take your phone, any Wi-Fi out of your bedroom. In, you know, if you can't get away from it, get it out of your bedroom so you sleep and you let your cells communicate at night to detoxify and that will speed up recovery. Yeah, getting Wi-Fi, turning it off, getting in your bed a place where you're away from Wi-Fi is probably a, a very good thing to do. If you can't completely get away from your phone because it's your alarm clock or whatever, at least get 10 feet to 20 feet. All right, it's true. There, it's sad to say there's a new industry that's coming about, and that's where they can put paint on the wall that keeps out EMF, they can do a bunch of things. So I think do your best. Do your best to start with simple things and get those away from you and see if that doesn't help. Uh, uh, several questions if you can take them on. Do you, is there any names you recommend if you wanted to do research on those low, low voltage machines you were talking about? Are there um, names of, I mean, if you wanted to Google it and look at the research? Or, is there a brand name you think is good? Oh, um, yes, since you asked me if there's a brand name. Where's Gail? What's your? Alpha Alpha Stim. How do you spell it? A-L-F-A, -L -L -L, yeah, just like A-L-P-H-A, -A, Alpha Stim. Stim. Yeah. Or can you just go somewhere and have it perform? You can. Yeah, you can. Like we do it in our clinic. I think there are other clinics. That, you know, we're like the Holland Clinic is like half the, half the earth away from here. You know, so I think Gail, do you happen to know, or does anyone know if there anybody? What Minnesota Natural Medicine? Not anymore. Not anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'll if I'll look and I'll I'll give the information to Gail to pass along to the group to see if there's something local. That you can do, but it's that device runs around. You need a physician's order. Newbridge Clinic, um, Indiana does have some. Can you, they let me actually come and try it out there. Mm -hmm. I actually bought it. I just called it up myself. And yeah. And they're great. You can just make payments. I make payments once a month. And you're talking about the Alpha Stim? Yes. Yeah. We sell the Alpha Stim in our clinic, too. You, and you, you have to have a, a physician's prescription. So Newbridge does, and then we do. Yeah. But you also do offer treatments with your... Yeah, you can try out the microcurrent machine and see if it helps you to see if it's something that maybe you do find beneficial. Is your clinic in the Twin Cities? It's in Minnetonka. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a bit of a drive. I had, well, let's go here. So if somebody comes to see you, what is the process of, uh, is there a specific testing that you do to decide what the course of action is? So I don't, I'm not an antibiotic person for Lyme disease, and I don't do the herbals for Lyme disease, but I do try to pair you up with somebody that I think is a good fit for that. But I like to do the rest, you know, the functional medicine piece, which is let's get the garbage out. Let's see if we need microcurrent for this. Let's see if you're an EWAT person. So it's really about kind of putting that package together. We see what your nutrition is like and what are some simple things we can do. So it's building that plan. So I would say... Lyme disease is one piece of it, and whether you go the antibiotic route or the herbal route, you know, depends on the person. And then, but I think you need the whole other package to go with that. Yep. I was recently diagnosed with mast cell 
Oh boy. Mm -hmm. I am not. Um, is it um, Stephanie Belseth? Is she? Okay. Um, there was somebody at the University of Minnesota, and he's no longer there. It's. Yeah. Boy, it's a tough disease. It's a really tough. Yeah, and you know we're seeing we're seeing a lot of it, um, which make me it makes me see we put a label on something, but we don't understand this massive increase in whatever mast cell is activation. It's got to be environmental toxins, something that's just driving all of that. Yeah. So maybe a you know it's either you know the thing about yeah mast m a s t you know one thing we do know is there's a lot of aluminum in the environment much more than has ever been before and with aluminum it likes to hang in the body it will hang on to antigens it'll combine with them and it'll hang on to body proteins and you combine all of that then what you get is autoimmunity. So I do wonder if heavy body burden of aluminum for those genetically predisposed to autoimmunity is creating these, now we call it autism, now we call it mast cell, now we call it whatever, but it seems to be underneath all of this, there's just some common denominator that's causing people to be so sick. I mean, really sick. And we didn't see this. Even when I started in medicine, you know, some 25 years ago, we weren't seeing these kind of chronic illnesses. So there's something that is causing this wave of chronic illness. Like the Bartonella? Yeah. Some people, I think, it's controversial and we don't know. We don't know the answer to that. Um, I think it's better to maybe have the Bartonella treated first and do the other, then, then come in if you've got, still you've got Lyme. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Okay. I'm embarrassed to ask this. I'm still working on getting a positive diagnosis. You are not alone. <laughs> yeah. How do we get the, a positive diagnosis? Yeah. It's so hard. So my colleagues who, yeah, my colleagues who are, who have been doing Lyme disease for a long time, one I trust quite a bit, said he's given up on the test, lab test, and he's doing the muscle testing. So he does, where he has individual vials, he'll have Bartonella, he'll have the Beridia, Borrelia, he'll have all the individual vials, and he do a muscle, does a testing for that, he's blinded to the vials, and he said, in his mind, that's more accurate than the, the lab tests we currently have because they're just not very good. So you might want to get somebody who does that. I can give you his name and if you would be interested in doing that. That's the best we've got, believe it or not. Along those lines, there's an outfit out in California uh, for 2500 or $3,500 for all these lab tests and whatever. Mm -hmm. Where they, if you can, if you catch it and grow it, there it is. You see it. But if you miss it, you know, you can't say you don't have it. Much. Yeah, it's That's tough. Than my doctor who says there's no such thing as Lyme disease. Yeah, yeah. I know. I live in North of Brainerd, up in Brainerd. Oh. I live in the woods. There's a, there's a, there's a physician that I just met at a conference that's going to be practicing in the Brainerd area. I can't remember his name. I, um, I'll give it, I'll, if I find it, I'll give it to Gail, and she'll pass it along. You're going to have somebody up there. Oh, he'd be.
<laughs> got it. You got to up that vitamin B12. <laughs> I don't think he's treating anyone. Oh. Okay. Oh, yeah. One last question. The, yes. So sparkling water isn't that isn't mineral water. It doesn't have minerals in it, so it won't have the magnesium in it. So you want to look for mineral water, like Perrier is one of the pure versions of that. It's from France. What's that? It's from France, yeah. It's, a, it's a, from the ground and it has, actually has minerals like magnesium in it. Comes in a green bottle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but the sparkling water, it does not have the minerals in it. So this, these, uh, you, you mentioned whole foods and buying some powdered packet of fruit and vegetable stuff. Mm -hmm. Mix it and put it in Perrier water. Yep. What brand do you buy this fruit and vegetable stuff? Oh, Sarah, do you? I mean, I can't remember the. Neutrodine. Neutrodine. But that's not going to be in Whole Foods. No, but uh, I like the maple, maple plain area. So, and I put it up there, and they have a um, building. Uh, so you can order it online. You'll see, it'll, you'll see it, they're really easy to spot. They're in their supplement sections, and there are different varieties of them, but it'll say greens. And then one might be more of a fruit and vegetable. So there are quite a few. But if they're in Whole Foods, they've been, at least they used to be, they, they at least are, guarantee some quality there that they've looked for heavy metals and they should be a good quality. So. And it helps with leg cramps? Yes. The, but come, the, yeah. Huge. Yeah, I really strongly suggest doing the Perrier and the, uh, doing a fruit and vegetable powder for the antioxidants. Mm. And that made the magnesium carbonate. Oh, there you go. So you weren't getting the laxative effect of the milk of magnesium, but you were getting the magnesium. Oh. That, that took care of my leg cramps within probably four or five days. Yeah. So again, the key is the magnesium. And yeah. It was so simple. I mean, a bottle of milk of magnesium, like three bucks, so that was five dollars for, for 12 bottles. Okay. Another clue. All right, I think, um, Should we do one more? Yeah. We need to close up. Well, that's why I don't like to do it all as a pill. That's why I love to have you drink your mag drink your magnesium, and take a magnesium bath, do the Epsom salts bath, so you're not downing all the pills because you know we have receptors in our gut and our body to absorb things. But they will only absorb so much. They're not meant to be overloaded. So you could probably take a lot but not absorb it, which is why you get the laxative effect. So I like to have you, in order to get it in, mix it up and do things like the Epsom salts bath. You'll get magnesium in. And do that Perrier, a mineral, good quality mineral water. Okay? All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Kelly. You're welcome. Thank you.